All right, well, you guys can be seated. Welcome back to Fall Nights. How are you guys? Yeah. It is so good to see you all. Man, I just love you guys. It's so much fun being here with you guys and seeing you guys laughing and smiling and hitting me with dodgeballs in the alleyway. It's fantastic. Hey, if you don't have a Bible, um, we would like to hand you a Bible. So if you don't have a Bible with you, you can raise up your hand. We'll get one to you. And if you have your soap journal, I want to encourage you to grab your soap journal. Grab it on out. We're at week three in our series, No Turning Back, as we're looking at the book of Galatians. And if you forgot your journal last week and you marked up in it, it is in the entranceway in the lobby right there at that office on the shelf. So you can go check that real quick and come right back. And um, if you have not gotten a soap journal yet, you can also raise your hand up. We have a few more that we'd like to give to you. So you can put that hand up, keep it up until uh, someone hands you one. So how are you guys tonight? Are you good? Are you guys awake? Let's try that again. How are you guys tonight? But that's like Kaylin only. I only heard Kaylin. How are you guys tonight? Good. Man, it is so good to be with you. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I am very excited to share God's word with you. Hey, if you're new here tonight, you've never been here, we're so thankful that you are here. We believe that God is real, that God loves you, and that God desires to speak to you tonight. And if this is your 50th time or your 100th time, we believe the same exact thing. We believe that the same God desires to speak to you again by his word. We believe that he desires to lift you up, to encourage you, you, to comfort you, and to speak to you by his word. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So Galatians chapter three, we're going to read and then we're going to pray and then we're going to dive on into it. So Galatians chapter three, beginning in verse one. If you need a Bible, keep your hand raised. We've got one more. Put that hand up. Galatians chapter three, beginning in verse one. It says this. Read with me. Oh, foolish Galatians. Some translations say, you crazy Galatians. Another translation even says, oh, my dear idiots, the Galatians. Yes, seriously. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Verse 2, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Everyone say faith. Faith. Or with hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Faith. Everyone say faith. faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith. Everyone say faith. faith. It is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Everyone say faith. faith. Are you guys getting the picture here? Okay. That God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for better group participation tonight. I pray, Lord, that you open up our ears and our eyes to what you desire to speak to us. I pray, God, that you would increase our faith to believe in you, to trust in you. God, I pray that you meet us here tonight. And I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, I pray that tonight, God, that you would reveal yourself to them and that you would persuade them to put their faith in you. God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are faithful. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. The title of our message today, thank you for the group participation. The title of our message today is Trust Issues. Look to the person next to you and say, can I trust you? 
How many of you have trust issues? Anyone? Anyone been in a bad relationship before and you have trust issues? I've got some stories for you. I remember being about 15 years old, 16 years old, and I went on a uh, road trip to Big Sur. Anyone ever been to Big Sur before? It's absolutely beautiful. I went on a road trip with some friends. It was just us, a couple of 16, 15, 17 year olds. We went up to surf and camp. And while we were up there and were driving up, my buddies, they spent all their money in one day. All the money they had in their wallet, everything on their card, they spent it all on food and treats on the way to Big Sur. So by Saturday morning, when they woke up, they were begging me to buy them breakfast, lunch, dinner, gas on the way home. We uh, had a flat tire. I had to fix that. They had to beg me for everything. And they promised me that they would pay me back. Now, guess what? We are, I don't know how many years later, but they have still not paid me back. Guess how much I spent that weekend? $500 on those two boys. Yes, that's a 16 year old, that's a lot of money, okay? $500, still to this day, they have not delivered on their promise. And be honest with you, I kinda have some trust issues with them today. But have you ever been in that place before where someone has promised something and failed to deliver on that promise? Maybe it's someone you've looked up to. Maybe it's a parent, a family member, a mentor, a coach. They promise to put you on that position in the team. They promise to reward you with a gift. They promise to take you on a trip and they fail to deliver on the promise. Anyone ever had that happen before? Well, here in the book of Galatians, the Galatians, they had some major trust, trust issues. They were doubting that God would fulfill his promise for them. And what's that promise? That promise is the promise of new life. If you remember, we've been looking at the gospel. Everyone say gospel. The gospel is really the main theme of the book of Galatians. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that when you were against God, God was for you. It is the good news that God was willing to trade his life or our life for his life. He was willing to die so that we could live. He was willing when we were sinners to die for our sin so that we could experience life. This is the gospel that he who is without sin became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God. It is the good news of Jesus Christ that he offers you life, not on your best day, but on your worst day. And all we have to do is respond in faith. This is the gospel. And they believed in the gospel. They trusted in the gospel. They responded to God's grace, his undeserving, unearned love and favor. But by this point, they were beginning to listen to other people. And they began to get in this trap to where they were having trust issues and believing that God's grace was enough. They believed that God's grace was enough to get them started, but wasn't enough to keep them going. Let me say that again. They were believing and their trust issue was they believed that God's grace was enough to get them started, but not enough to keep them going in life. And so rather than trusting in God, they began to trust in themselves. They had major trust issues. You see, it's important to know that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he traded his life for our life, that he died in our place, it's important to understand that the gospel is not the ABCs of Christianity. The gospel is the A to Z of Christianity. There is not, the, the gospel and the good news and the grace of God isn't just first base. No, it's the whole game. It's all of it. It's all about his grace and his good news and the fact that we cannot earn it and deserve it. But the Galatians, they were moving on from grace and they were going back to trusting in themselves. So the Paul the Apostle is writing to them and he's reminding them that it is one thing to trust Jesus to change your life, but Jesus wants us to trust him with all of our life. And that brings us to point number one. From verses one through three, we see that Paul is telling them, that it's one thing to trust Jesus to change your life, 
But Jesus calls us and wants us to trust him with all of our life. I want you to understand this because many of you have been to church. Many of you guys have responded to the gospel. You've heard the good news of Jesus. You've raised your hand. You've come forward. You asked Jesus to come into your heart. You've responded. But you think that it's just a moment thing. That's all Jesus cares about. That one moment. That one moment where I respond. And then, you know what? I just go about my life. And Jesus doesn't really interact with my daily life and my daily mind and my daily desires. He's just absent from those things. That's a temptation that we all have. But Paul is writing for them to understand that it, Jesus desires for them to trust him with all of their lives. And it's the same thing for us. God desires you to trust him for a lifetime, not just a moment, for, for all of our lives. Let's read verses one through three again. He says, Oh foolish Galatians, oh you crazy Galatians, have you lost your sense? Have you lost your mind? Has someone bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul is telling them, Galatians, snap out of it. If it was Jesus that started your life, if it's Jesus that gave you new life, he's going to keep you going. He's not going to stop at this momentary thing where you invite Jesus into your heart. He's saying, listen, if it was the Spirit that started you off, the Spirit of God is going to see you through. God's not done with you. God desires to continue to relate with you on the basis of relationship and not religion. God desires to, to relate to you on the basis of love and not the law. The law being a bunch of rules, a bunch of do this and don't do that. God's saying, I want you to come back to me on that relationship of love. I want you to trust me with all of my life. Paul's saying, wow, did I not clearly portray to you Jesus crucified? Did I not tell you about the God of the universe who left heaven and came to earth on a rescue mission for you? Did I not tell you that he lived the perfect life you couldn't and died on the cross for your sin? Did I not tell you that he went through all of that and then he conquered sin and death and rose from the grave? He did all of that just to get you to first base? Just to get you going? He's like, no, that's crazy. He did all of that to change all of your life, not just a moment in your life. He did all of that because he desires to have a relationship with you daily. He's like, how did you miss the point? How did you get to this place? God desires for you to trust him all the time, not to result back in trusting yourselves. It's kind of like this. Imagine for a moment, really imagine this in your mind. Imagine that you're stuck. You're stuck on the island. You're all alone. And actually, you did something very bad in order for you to get there. You're banished there. Close your eyes. Imagine it for, this, for a second. Imagine yourself on this island. You're banished. You were sent there. You deserved it. But, but there's this news, this, this headline that went out. Your name is Banished Hopeless. And all these news outlets, they're, they're putting a picture of you there on the front cover. Imagine it in your mind. And this pilot, this pilot comes and this pilot sees a picture of you. He sees that you're hopeless on this island. And the pilot says, you know what? I'm going to go find them. So the pilot gets in his plane. Imagine this for a second. You're still there on the island all alone, all hopeless. And, and the pilot begins to fly. He doesn't even know where you are. He's just flying around the whole world trying to find you. Weeks go by. You're still on that island alone. Months go by. You're still on that island alone. Finally, the pilot goes into uncharted territory. He gets into that uncharted territory and he finds this island he'd never been to. Sure enough, he sees you there. You, you there being on the island, you see this plane approaching. You're like, oh my goodness, there's a pilot. You begin to wave him down. And then what happens? He comes and he lands and you get into the plane and the pilot hugs you. He embraces you. He's like, man, I'm so glad I found you. I didn't want you to be left hopeless. He gets you into the airplane. You take off. And then the pilot jumps out of the plane and says, you figure it out. Is that silly? 
Does that make any sense to you? Of course not. If the pilot was going to go through all that trouble to rescue you, he would bring you home safely. And in the same way, if God went through all of that to rescue you from your sin, he is going to see you and send you home to heaven safely. He's not going to abandon you halfway and say, now it's up to you to figure out the rest. Do you understand the picture? God is there to see you through. God desires for you to trust him, not just in the takeoff, but on the entire plane ride home to heaven. God desires for you to trust him with everything. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That means that God is going to see you through. God's not going to give up on you. God's not going to be mad at you because you failed and messed up one time. God desires for you to constantly rely and trust on him. Friends, it's called faith. Everyone say faith. God desires for you to place your faith in him each day and every day. God promises to get you started and he promises to see you through. Friends, grace is good enough to get you going and grace is good enough to see you finish. He's going to see you finish the race, which brings me to point number two. God's promise has nothing to do with your performance. God's promise has nothing to do with your performance. What does that mean? Let's read there in verses four through nine. It says, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he, Jesus, who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by the works of law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. God made a promise. God made a promise a long time ago. In fact, it's in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 15. There was this guy named Abraham. You guys remember Abraham? Raise your hand if you remember Abraham. Abraham, he was known as the father of faith. Now Abraham, think about this for a second. Abraham, Abraham had an experience with God far before Moses was alive, and Moses went up the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive the Ten Commandments, and that's where all the do's and don'ts of the Bible come from. Far before that, in fact, 430 years before that, Abraham had an encounter with God. And do you know what that encounter was? Abraham was called by God by faith to leave his homeland and to go on a journey. Abraham didn't know where he was going. Abraham didn't really know what he was doing. All he knew that God was calling him. And finally in Genesis chapter 15, we read that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now that's some fancy words for this. Because of Abraham's belief in God, God was willing to grant him eternal life. God, because of Abraham's belief, counted it right to Abraham for Abraham to have a right relationship with God. God was granting Abraham his account of blessing into Abraham's life. He was imputing it and giving it to Abraham because of belief. And something happened there. God made something called a covenant. Now, I'm married. I've been married for almost three years. Or has it been three years? I forget for a second. It's been three years. Yeah, it's been three years. Okay. I've been married for three years. Definitely. My, my, my daughter's two and a half. It's been three years. Um, it's been three years. And on that wedding day, on July 15th, 2017, I made a covenant before God with my wife 
On that day, I said that I would take Veronica as my bride and I was committing to be in a marriage with her for a lifetime. And the thing with the covenant, the only thing, the covenant was like a legal contract. And the only way to break a covenant is by death. That's why when you get married, it says, till death do we part. And you say, I do. So it's a covenant. It's a very strong legal contract. And in Genesis chapter 15, God made a covenant with Abraham. He made a legal contract. It was a marriage, but it was a covenant. It was a promise to Abraham. And the way that they did this was they would get a cow and they would cut the cow in half. Yes. And they would separate half the cow right here and half the cow over here. And there'd be all this blood in the middle. And you would have to step across this bloody entrance, this bloody doorway. And when you pass through that bloody cow, you were saying, if I break this covenant, I'd be as good as that cow. I should die if I break this covenant. And so God was making a covenant with Abraham. And what happened in Genesis chapter 15 is we read, we read that a deep sleep fell upon Abraham as they were making this covenant. And a couple verses later, we read that this cloud of fire came down and passed through that cow and that that line of blood. This cloud of fire made the covenant. In other words, God was making a promise to Abraham. And get this. This is the big picture. The promise wasn't based on Abraham's end of the bargain. In fact, Abraham had no part of the bargain. It was God saying, listen, I promise to bless you and all the nations through you. I promise to send a deliverer. I'm making this promise and it is completely based on me. You know why? Because God knew Abraham would mess up. So God's promise was not based on Abraham's performance. And the same thing is true about us. God has made a promise to you. That if you would respond to him in belief, if you would respond in faith to Jesus and invite him into your life, he would give you life and life more abundant and he is faithful to keep the promise. See, it's easy to think and the problem is, is that we will have an encounter with God, we'll begin to walk with God and then we will fail and we'll mess up and we'll say, God doesn't want to do anything with me anymore. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. God must be mad at me. God must, I don't know if I, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. I don't know if Jesus loves me anymore. I don't know what the deal is. And here in Galatians 3, he's telling us that God has made a promise to you that he has given you life and life more abundant. And it is not based on your performance. The promise is same on your best day as your worst day. God is faithful to keep the promise. He's faithful to do it. You see, grace requires absolutely nothing from us. So what's faith then? If God requires faith, isn't that something from us? No, faith equals divine persuasion. Say that with me. Faith equals divine persuasion. Say that with me. Faith equals divine persuasion. What faith is, it's faith is God divinely persuading you that he is so good, that he is so great, that he is so amazing, that he is so wonderful, that he is so out of this world. It is him persuading us to place our trust in him. Faith is what's keeping you on that seat right now. When you looked at that seat, you didn't even really think about it. But when you sat down on that seat, you trusted that it would support you. But if I went and I went and undid all the screws on that seat and you went and sat on it, what would happen? You would fall apart. It would break and you would fall on the ground. See, faith, we use faith all the day, all the time. When you drive or you get in the car with someone, you are trusting, you have faith, you're persuaded that the person on the other side of the road isn't going to veer into your lane. 
It's faith. We practice faith all the time. Faith isn't something that we have to work for. Faith is us simply trusting and believing in someone. And so that is all grace requires is for us to respond in faith, to be so persuaded by God and his goodness that we trust in him. Therefore, God's promise has nothing to do with our performance. All he asks is for us to believe in him. All we ask is for him to trust in him. It's like when I pick up my daughter, Presley. Like I said, she's two and a half years old. And sometimes I just love to throw her up in the air. I just love it. I love, especially in rooms like this, I can throw her so high. And guess what? She believes every single time that her daddy's going to catch her. Every single time she has faith. Sometimes she's got a face of terror, like, on her face. But she still thinks I'm going to catch her. And in the same way, God desires for us to constantly live in a way where we believe that God's going to catch us, even on our worst days, that God is there for us. It's faith. How does faith come? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we continue to see God in his goodness, as we hear about how good God is, it increases our faith. And faith is like a key that unlocks God's spirit in moving in our lives. Faith is like a key that unlocks God's spirit to work in our lives. We don't have to do a bunch of things in order to see God work in our lives. We simply have to believe and trust in faith. And that's how we see God work in our lives. Faith is the key that unlocks the spirit of God from working in our lives. And we, when we begin to trust that we have to earn our way for God to do things for us in order for God to work in our life, in order for God to bless our life, in order for God to, to work in our hearts, when we begin to feel like we have to do things to earn that, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 says we're insulting the spirit of grace. We're insulting God and what he's done at the cross. Paul's like, don't you even remember Christ and him crucified? He went through all of that to get you going, and to see you finish to the end. Which brings us to number three. God is not a promise breaker. He is a promise keeper. You can trust in God. We have trust issues, like the Galatians. We feel like, man, God must be so mad at me. He's not going to fill his end of the bargain. Listen, it's only his end of the bargain. There's nothing we have to do. And he is faithful to keep his promise to us. Verse 14, skip down there with me. It says this, Christ Jesus, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. In other words, the covenant That bloody, gruesome cow thing that God walked through and Abraham was sleeping, that he made a promise to Abraham that day, thousands of years later, God fulfilled that promise by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So Jesus died in our place so that we could have eternal life. And it is then by Jesus coming that he fulfilled the promise that God gave to Abraham thousands of years before. Listen, God is not a promise breaker. God is a promise keeper. And man, did you know there's hundreds of promises in the Bible just for you. There's promises of peace. There's promises of joy. There's promises that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. There's promises in the scriptures for you. And God is not a promise breaker. He is a promise keeper. Psalm 145 verse 13 says, The Lord is faithful in all of his words and kind in all of his works. He's faithful in all of his words. In everything he says, he is faithful to deliver the promise. He's not going to give up on you. All we have to do is simply respond in faith, to trust in him to believe in him. 
and to allow him to work in our lives. So at this time, I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And I want to ask you, what in your life are you not trusting God with? What is it in your life that you have failed to trust God in it? What is it in your life that you are relying on yourself to figure it all out? Is it a relationship with someone? You don't believe that God cares about your relationships? Is it your future? You don't think God cares about your future? Is it your thoughts? The emotions? The things that you're dealing with? Do you not think that God cares about those things? What is it that you aren't trusting God with? Listen, God's desire is not for you to trust Him with only one part of your life, but all of your life. Like my daughter Presley, He wants you to trust Him that He will catch you every single time. Listen, He has a plan for you. Christian, young man, young woman, young husband, husband to be, wife to be, mom to be, dad to be. Listen, God has a plan. He's faithful to see you through. He will not break his promises. Do you trust in him? Or do you feel like you have to figure it all out? Listen, tonight's God saying, you don't have to figure it all out. You simply need to believe in me. Believe in me. Let's do that right now. Will you guys pray with me? All right, bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, we come before you. We thank you, God, that you desire for us to trust you with all of our life. We thank you, God, that you are faithful to keep your promises. Lord, I pray that you would meet us here tonight. I pray, Lord, if there is anyone here that's not trusting an area of their life to you, God, I pray that they would give it to you, that they would invite you in to that area of their life. And as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here tonight and you've never responded to God, I want to give you an opportunity to do so right now. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here tonight and you've never heard the gospel, the good news, let me tell you, God loves you. God has a plan for you. And the Bible says that we have been left to ourselves because of our sin, that our sin has separated us from God, that our sin has left us feeling lonely and guilty and depressed and hopeless and bummed out. Our sin has left us, separated us from God. But the Bible tells us that even when we were against God, God wanted to be with you. God was for you. And the Bible says that he left heaven to come to earth to deal with this problem called sin. He died on the cross for you so that you could have life. And all he asks is for you to respond to him in belief. That's it. It's like you are there stranded on that island and God is on a rescue mission for you. All you need to get do is get in the plane with him. All you need to do is trust in him to rescue you, to change your life. And if you're here tonight and you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do so right now. So his heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you and a friend brought you here tonight, would you just raise up your hand and say, that's me. I want to trust in Jesus. I feel like I'm left all alone. I feel like I'm hopeless. I feel like no one cares. I feel like, man, I'm just at the end of it. If that's you and you're, you want to respond to God, reach up your hand to God. God is reaching his hand down to you. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just put up your hand and say, that's me. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, just go up, go ahead and just raise your hand up to God. In an attitude of saying, that's me, God, I want to have a relationship with you. Give you one more opportunity. If that's you, just raise up your hand. Say, that's me. God, I want to have a relationship with you. 
Well, we've been doing this the last three nights, and I believe that there aren't hands going up because God has already reached down to you, and God has already picked you up, and God has already set you off on a solid ground, and He's already working in your life. But listen, you know what happens? Is we can get into a place where we think that grace is only for a moment. And we begin to rely on ourselves again. We think God's all mad at us and that God's left us and that God doesn't have a plan for us anymore. And, and man, it can lead us to being bummed out. And if that's you tonight and you just want to say, God, I need a fresh filling of your grace, would you raise your hand and respond and say, that's me. I've been missing the point like the Galatians. I've been missing out on God's grace. If that's you, can you just raise up your hand as heads are bowed and eyes are closed and say, hey, I want a fresh filling of God's grace. If that's you, just raise up your hand and say, yes, I want a fresh filling of his grace. I want to trust in him more. If that's you, just raise up your hand and say, yes, that's me. My hand is raised. Lord, I pray that God right now that you would help us to trust in you more and more every day. God, I pray that we would rely on you more and more every single day. God, forgive us for trusting in ourselves time and time again. Your word tells us that it's an insult of your grace. God, help us to rely on your grace, not only to get us going, to, but to keep us going. God, I pray right, right now as we, we enter into a time of communion and just worship, God, I pray that you would move in our hearts and that you would reveal to us what it is that we need to place our faith in you, an area of my, our lives that we're holding on to and we need to give to you. Reveal that to us right now and help us lay that down at your feet. God, we welcome you here during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just encountered God for the first time, we'd love to hear from you. Just go ahead and check out the link in the description below or follow us on our social media handles right here to keep up with all that God is doing here at Calvary Vista.